It was the early hours of the morning of the 12th of November 1976, and soldiers were on sentry duty at the Spanish Air Force base at Talavera La Real when they heard a strange and piercing sound. At first akin to typical radio interference, the noise is said to have evolved to become an acute, penetrating whistle so loud and uncomfortable that it forced the soldiers to abandon their posts and investigate the area. Their search ultimately led them to a forest, and a ten feet tall luminous figure which seemed to consist entirely of small points of light. Frightening and faceless, it stood before the soldiers as they fired their weapons at it, only for it to fade and vanish. Odd lights were also seen in the sky above the base that night, with the case of the Talavera entity going on to be investigated by both the Air Force and UFO experts, with their conclusions suggesting that something very strange did indeed take place, with unidentified flying objects and quite possibly their occupants now whispered to have visited the area both that night in 1976 and at other times throughout the 20th century. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar, and stay to the end of this video to find out about my upcoming meet and greet. The Talavera La Real Air Base is located close to the Spanish-Portuguese border, just outside the medieval city of Badajoz. Whilst the province's history is rich in many ways, it boasts a surprising fame when it comes to UFO and extraterrestrial sightings, with Valencian Vincente Juan Ballesta Olmos, a veteran UFO researcher and author who played a key role in the declassification of Spanish Air Force UFO files in the 1990s, stating that the area has accounted for no less than 35% of Spanish case studies over a 50-year period, from 19 50 to 1999. Its most famous story to date is undoubtedly that of the Talavera entity, a case which not only involved both UFOs and an alleged craft occupant, but made its way into the very Air Force files Ballester Olmos and others worked to declassify. For indeed, not only was the strangeness witnessed by multiple on-the-record Air Force personnel, including three airmen and an officer, it was also investigated by the higher-ups. However, before we dive too deeply into the details, please allow a brief moment for me to thank the sponsor of this video, QB. QB is a leading provider of 3D wooden puzzles, specialising in DIY book nooks. If you're like me, you not only adore reading books, but gazing upon them as a vital part of your home decor also, and so a book nook is the ideal decorative piece to enhance any bookshelf. Not only that, being a puzzle in of itself, Cuteby's book nooks make the perfect project for sci-fi and horror enthusiasts who enjoy hands-on creativity. I recently completed assembling their Eye of the Old God book nook and greatly enjoyed setting aside time for some no-obligation relaxation at the end of a busy day. It was especially enjoyable to indulge in the scene's storyline, a cavern beneath the Martian surface in which researchers seek unknown creatures believed to descend from the ancient dominion. The Eye of the Old God, a giant-eyed monster with tentacles, emerges from the centre truly tantalising your imagination as you construct a flawlessly themed nook to sit amongst your alien and UFO book collection. In addition to being relaxing and immersive, Cute Bee's book nooks are also well thought out in terms of quality and durability. Materials are high quality and instructions easy to follow. I particularly enjoy the added dust cover, which keeps your book nook looking clean and wonderful amidst your precious collectibles. And so, if you'd like to enhance your own bookshelves and room decor, why not explore the mysterious world of the Eye of the Old God for yourself by visiting Cute Bee's website. Simply click my link in the description to check out both that book nook and the other creative DIY puzzle projects they have available. Thank you for listening, and thus helping to support the work I do for this channel. Now, on with the video. 
Jose Maria Trejo and Juan Carrizosa Luján were on sentry duty in the fuel stock zone of the Talavera Lariel Air Force Base and Jet Aircraft School just outside of Badajoz. Each positioned within a sentry box some 60 meters apart, both airmen expected a usual night of sentinel work. And yet, around 1.45 am, they heard what they later described to researcher Juan Jose Benitez as an acute, penetrating whistle, so piercing that it hurt our ears. It lasted for no more than five minutes before ceasing, only for it to begin again shortly afterwards, this time close to Trejo's position. Concerned there was an intruder attempting to access the fuel stock zone, Trejo called for the other sentry to come over and help him search the area. According to the Flying Saucer Review article, in which the case featured some time later, both airmen were equipped with loaded weapons, standard issue Z-62 rifles. In spite of their searching, the airmen could not find anything, and so returned to their stations. Once again, however, the noise returned, with the men reporting how they thought they were either mad or would be driven mad by the sharp and penetrating sound. Each time the noise returned, it seemed to last for around five minutes before stopping. Each time, the men were left clueless as to its origin. It was at this point, frustrated by the sound, that the two Spanish sentries had their attention caught by something else a light high in the sky above them. Similar in appearance to a flare, it has been described as having illuminated a wide area in the direction of Badajoz, lasting a mere 15 or 20 seconds before disappearing. Soon afterwards, a third sentry by the name of Jose Hidalgo appeared. He, like Trejo and Luján, had seen the strange glowing light in the sky in the course of his watch. Increasingly concerned as to what was going on, the three airmen decided to alert a nearby corporal, who thus sounded the alarm and arranged for support guards to perform a general sweep of the area. As part of this, the three original sentries, Trejo, Luhan, and Hidalgo, returned to the fuel stockpile, along with one of the airbase's German Shepherd guard dogs. All is said to have been silent as they continued on, following the base's boundary wall in the pitch black night. It was as the men were approaching a new, under construction sentry box that they are claimed to have experienced yet another strangeness, some manner of whirlwind. Described by Trejo as localized in one spot, the anomalous force caused the airmen to stop. The guard dog that was with them, despite being military trained, was oddly unresponsive. This would soon change, however, when the sound of branches being broken came from a nearby plantation of eucalyptus trees. The dog was released into the forest, only for him to return a few seconds later, strange and staggering. It was as though the animal was seasick, one of the sentries later told the reporter almost as though he was reacting to someone or something having attacked, thrashed, and terrified him. We were baffled, so the airman's translated testimony continued. Four or five times we got the dog to go back to the eucalyptus trees, and every time he came back in just the same way. His ears seemed to be hurting, he was whimpering. Then, when he returned to us for the last time, he started circling around us. According to the Flying Saucer Review article on the case, this was a sign from the military-trained animal that there was a danger which threatened the airmen. The dog was, in short, placing itself as a physical barrier between the man and whatever it had encountered in the trees. And so, increasingly worried for their safety, the three sentries shouted into the eucalyptus plantation, demanding whoever was in there to reveal themselves. No one appeared. Instead, the dog continued to circle and snarl, faster and increasingly agitated. It was then that one of the men, Jose Maria Trejo, reported experiencing a sensation of there being someone behind him. Chills raced through his body, encouraging him to turn slightly. And so it was that he supposedly saw a greenish light out of the corner of his eye. Turning fully now, he is said to have beheld the most fantastic thing he had ever seen in his life. 
some manner of giant luminous figure emerging from the trees. According to the description provided by the men, the figure was humanoid and stood at least three meters or ten feet tall. Peculiarly, it seemed to be made up of many small points of light, which appeared brighter closer to the entity's periphery. Its body was thick, and its arms were long and crossed. On its head, the giant apparition seemed to be wearing some sort of equally luminous helmet. As far as the men could tell, it was standing on the ground rather than floating above it. Despite having his weapon loaded and in hand, an utterly horrified Trejo was unable to do anything to protect himself. Indeed, according to his testimony, he began to feel a sensation of general weakness which ultimately led him to fall to the ground against his will. Before he hit the floor, he managed to shout to his fellow sentries, down, they'll kill us. And so it was that Luhan and Hidalgo open fired on the colossal light being. Trejo struggled to watch the confrontation unfold from the ground, conscious but stuck, his vision starting to fail inexplicably. Almost the instant the firing started, there was said to have been a bright light akin to that of a photographer's flash, and the figure in that flash of light faded suddenly then vanished. Luhan and Hidalgo rushed to Trejo's aid, helping him from the ground. Speaking of his experience some year and a half later, the airman had this to say, It's strange, it was only when I tried to press the trigger of my rifle that I started to fall. It seemed as though that being had guessed my intentions, but how could that be possible? Indeed, how could such a thing be possible? Whatever the case, the luminous entity was gone, as was, strangely, all of the bullets that the two airmen had fired at it. For, as soon as there was enough daylight, airbase personnel conducted a thorough search of the conflict area. Not a single cartridge case could be found anywhere on the ground, despite a total of 40 to 50 having been fired. Likewise, no bullets were located, despite the wall of the base being close to where the entity had stood. The walls should have shown the marks of most of the shots, unless, of course, the giant luminous being had taken them with it when it disappeared. The bullets and the cartridges, somehow. According to the report on the case, the men's rifles were thoroughly inspected by Air Force experts. They had been fired, the bullets had been spent. Indeed, the additional guards who had been summoned by the corporal in order to sweep the area had heard the shooting, having arrived at the spot soon after Luhan and Hidalgo had helped Trejo from the ground. What the men had fired at was, however, a mystery. And as if the Talavera incident wasn't sensational enough already, a few days later, Jose Trejo had to be taken to hospital when his eyesight failed again. Similar to his experience on the ground before the 10 feet humanoid, he experienced a slow fade of his vision and then total blindness. He also lost consciousness, with the airman subsequently spending a total of 15 days under medical observation five at the sick bay on the base, and then ten at nearby Badajoz Hospital. There, he underwent many tests, including x-rays, blood work, sight and hearing examinations. Nothing could uncover the reason for his sudden blindness and mysterious loss of consciousness. A similar medical incident was to repeat only a few days after his release from hospital. On that occasion, Trejo described having to be helped out of the car by his girlfriend when his vision once again failed. On the 30th of November, some two weeks after the incident, he was moved to Madrid and the Air Force Hospital there. He remained at the hospital for one full month. Unable once more to come up with an explanation for the young airman's abnormal symptoms, the doctors stated he had suffered a nervous maladjustment. At the time of speaking to a reporter in 1978, Trejo was 21 years old and in a state of perfect health. Whatever the reason for his mysterious episodes of blindness in the aftermath of his encounter with the light being, he ultimately recovered. As for the military report on the incident, researcher Vincente Juan Balesta Olmos has stated that the episode was never considered by the command of the base as a UFO-type event. 
Instead, so the UFO expert has claimed, the event has all the traces of hallucinatory delirium by a person with a psychiatric history, combined with contagious hysteria, fear and confusion. And yet, in addition to there being no suggestion of psychiatric history, the three men also had no doubt whatsoever about what they had seen at the time, going on the record to state that the thing was something very much like a man, but very tall, and had been clearly seen by all three of them. There was, in their minds, no hallucinations or delirium of which to speak. And certainly, the Spanish airmen's claims are not inconsistent when one considers the wider field of UFO sightings and extraterrestrial encounters. In terms of the Rendlesham Forest incident, which took place only a few years after the one at Talavera La Real in December 1980, the personnel who approached the glowing triangular craft reported in the woods just beyond RAF Woodbridge's East Gate, Sergeant Jim Penniston and Airman John Burroughs described how they instinctually threw themselves to the forest floor at the site of the anomaly. Similar to Jose Trejo, they experienced odd physical sensations, including an uncertainty as to whether or not they still had control over their bodies. And increasingly comparable, the British airbase incident happened at a similar time of year and a similar time of morning to that of the Spanish Talavera La Real case. Elsewhere in the world again, notorious paranormal hotspot Skinwalker Ranch boasts reports of oversized creatures emerging from other dimensions and being impervious to bullets, in perhaps the same way that the Talavera entity was immune to those fired by the airmen. The Utah Ranch's bulletproof wolf, for example, is said to have been shot at multiple times by then-owner Terry Sherman. The creature was unfazed, and alongside many other extraordinary and indescribable entities, continued to haunt the family as they experienced a multitude of other oddities, including strange, seemingly sentient lights in the sky. And thus, for all their bizarreness, monstrous bulletproof cryptids being reported at UFO hotspots are not unheard of. One can even speak of the 1967 experiences of American Robert Salas and the early hours missile shutdown at Malmstrom Air Force Base near Great Falls, Montana. Not only that, the province in which the Talavera La Real sighting occurred, Badajoz, has a legacy of similarly anomalous happenings. Only a few months before the appearance of the luminous light being, for example, an operator in the control tower of the airbase is said to have detected anomalies which were duly logged and filed away by the Air Force. Then, earlier still, in 1967, the pilots of a plane heading to the Talavera base and flying over a northeasterly town claimed to have observed a strange, shape-changing object in the sky close to them. Given the recurring relationship between aerial anomalies and Air Force activities, one is free to speculate why personnel like Trejo, Luhan and Hidalgo continue to report strange sightings and encounters. Whilst undoubtedly not all will be as otherworldly as they are claimed, it is surely too great of a coincidence for all to be the simple product of hallucinatory delirium, contagious hysteria, fear and or confusion. For those who fight for disclosure, it is hoped that the truth will one day be revealed. Until that time, all we can do is wait and watch, and perhaps catch sight for ourselves of the strangeness that, on occasion, is said to emerge from the darkness, bulletproof and luminous. Keep watching, a quick announcement before I go. If you watched my recent video, you'll know that last month Eric and I announced our soon-to-open Museum of the Paranormal and Spirituality. We've been hard at work, including in our rather overgrown and neglected graveyard, as some of you will have seen in my video over on my second channel. I was overwhelmed by the support and generous offers of help I received from that video, and so I'd love to invite any of you who are able to come to our Michaelmas Volunteer Afternoon on Sunday the 29th of September. 
Eric and I will be at our museum's graveyard from midday until 5pm, and would love to meet you, offer you a hot drink and a snack, and hopefully cut back a bramble or two together to help restore dignity to the people who chose to have their final resting place at Penuel Chapel. You can stay for as short a time as you like, help out with the tidying, or equally bring some cake and a smile to keep the workforce going. The full details, including how to find us, are available on our website, which is linked in the description. I can't wait to meet some of you. And so, with that said, thank you so much for watching. If you want to expand your support for the work that I do, go ahead and click those links I've mentioned in the description. You have my thanks. Until next time.